This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Deborah Lynn, Northern Lower Michigan, February 2007. Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. Part Fifth at Albrecham and Elsewhere. Thy aerial part, and all the fiery parts which are mingled in thee, though by nature they have an upward tendency, still in obedience to the disposition of the universe, they are overpowered here in the compound mass, the body. M. Antoninus. Long. 1. How Gillingham's doubts were disposed of will most quickly appear by passing over the series of dreary months and incidents that followed the events of the last chapter, and coming on to a Sunday in the February of the year following. Sue and Jude were living in Aldbrickham in precisely the same relations that they had established between themselves when she left Shaston to join him the year before. The proceedings in the law courts had reached their consciousness, but as a distant sound and an occasional missive which they hardly understood. They had met, as usual, to breakfast together in the little house with Jude's name on it, that he had taken at fifteen pounds a year, with three pounds ten extra for rates and taxes, and furnished with his aunt's ancient and lumbering goods, which had cost him about their full value to bring all the way from Mary Green. Sue kept house and managed everything. As he entered the room this morning, Sue held up a letter she had just received. "'Well, and what is it about?' he said, after kissing her. "'That the decree Nisi in the case of Phillotson versus Phillotson and Folly, pronounced six months ago, has just been made absolute.' "'Ah,' said Jude, as he sat down. The same concluding incident in Jude's suit against Arabella had occurred about a month or two earlier. Both cases had been too insignificant to be reported in the papers, further than by name in a long list of other undefended cases. "'Now then, Sue, at any rate, you can do what you like.' He looked at his sweetheart curiously. "'Are we, you and I, just as free now as if we had never married at all?' just as free, except I believe that a clergyman may object personally to remarry you and hand the job on to somebody else. But I wonder, do you think it is really so with us? I know it is generally, but I have an uncomfortable feeling that my freedom has been obtained under false pretenses. How? Well, if the truth about us had been known, the decree wouldn't have been pronounced. It is only, is it, because we have made no defense, and have led them into a false supposition. Therefore, is my freedom lawful, however proper it may be? Well, why did you let it be under false pretenses? You have only yourself to blame, he said mischievously. Do don't. You ought not to be touchy about that still. You must take me as I am. Very well, darling, so I will. Perhaps you were right. As to your question, we were not obliged to prove anything. That was their business. Anyhow, we are living together. Yes, though not in their sense. One thing is certain, that however the decree may be brought about, a marriage is dissolved when it is dissolved. There is this advantage in being poor, obscure people like us, that these things are done for us in a rough-and-ready fashion. It was the same with me and Arabella. I was afraid her criminal second marriage would have been discovered and she punished. But nobody took any interest in her, nobody inquired, nobody suspected it. If we'd been patented nobilities, we should have had infinite trouble, and days and weeks would have been spent in investigations. By degrees, Sue acquired her lover's cheerfulness at the sense of freedom, and proposed that they should take a walk in the fields, even if they had to put up with a cold dinner on account of it. Jude agreed, and Sue went upstairs and prepared to start, putting on a joyful colored gown in observance of her liberty, seeing which Jude put on a lighter tie. "'Now we'll strut arm in arm,' he said, like any other engaged couple. We've a legal right to.' 
They rambled out of the town and along a path over the low-lying lands that bordered it. Though these were frosty now, and the extensive seed-fields were bare of colour and produce. The pair, however, were so absorbed in their own situation that their surroundings were little in their consciousness. "'Well, my dearest, the result of all this is that we can marry after a decent interval.' "'Yes, I suppose we can,' said Sue, without enthusiasm. "'And aren't we going to?' "'I don't like to say no, dear Jude, but I feel just the same about it now as I have done all along.' I have just the same dread lest an iron contract should extinguish your tenderness for me and mine for you as it did between our unfortunate parents. Still, what can we do? I do love you, as you know, Sue. I know it abundantly, but I think I would much rather go on living always as lovers as we are living now and only meeting by day. It is so much sweeter, for the woman at least, and when she is sure of the man, and henceforward we needn't be so particular as we have been about appearances. Our experiences of matrimony with others have not been encouraging, I own, said he with some gloom, either owing to our own dissatisfied unpractical natures or by our misfortune. But we two should be two dissatisfied ones linked together, which would be twice as bad as before. I think I should begin to be afraid of you, Jude, the moment you had contracted to cherish me under a government stamp, and I was licensed to be loved on the premises by you. Ugh! How horrible and sordid! Although, as you are, free, I trust you more than any other man in the world. No, no, don't say I should change, he expostulated, if there was misgiving in his own voice also. Apart from ourselves and our unhappy peculiarities, it is foreign to a man's nature to go on loving a person when he is told that he must and shall be that person's lover. There would be a much likelier chance of his doing it if he were told not to love. If the marriage ceremony consisted in an oath and signed contract between the parties to cease loving from that day forward, in consideration of personal possession being given, and to avoid each other's society as much as possible in public, there would be more loving couples than there are now. Fancy the secret meetings between the perjuring husband and wife, the denials of having seen each other, the clambering in at bedroom windows and the hiding in closets. There'd be little cooling then. Yes, but admitting this or something like it to be true, you are not the only one in the world to see it, dear little Sue. People go on marrying because they can't resist natural forces, although many of them may know perfectly well that they are possibly buying a month's pleasure with a life's discomfort. No doubt my father and mother and your father and mother saw it, if they had all resembled us in habits of observation. But then they went and married just the same because they had ordinary passions. But you, Sue, are such a phantasmal, bodiless creature, one who, if you'll allow me to say it, has so little animal passion in you that you can act upon reason in the matter, when we poor unfortunate wretches of grosser substance can't. Well, she sighed, you've owned that it would probably end in misery for us, and I am not so exceptional a woman as you think. Fewer women like marriage than you suppose, only they enter into it for the dignity it is assumed to confer, and the social advantages it gains them sometimes a dignity and an advantage that I am quite willing to do without. Jude fell back upon his old complaint, that, intimate as they were, he had never once had from her an honest, candid declaration that she loved or could love him. "'I really fear sometimes that you cannot,' he said, with a dubiousness approaching anger, "'and you are so reticent. I know that women are taught by other women that they must never admit the full truth to a man.' but the highest form of affection is based on full sincerity on both sides. Not being men, these women don't know that in looking back on those he has had tender relations with, a man's heart returns closest to her who was the soul of truth in her conduct. The better class of man, even if caught by airy affectations of dodging and parrying, is not retained by them. A nemesis attends the woman who plays the game of elusiveness too often, in the utter contempt for her that sooner or later her old admirers feel, under which they allow her to go unlamented to her grave. Sue, who was regarding the distance, had acquired a guilty look, 
and she suddenly replied in a tragic voice, "'I don't think I like you to-day so well as I did, Jude.' "'Don't you? Why?' "'Oh, well, you are not nice. Too sermony. Though I suppose I am so bad and worthless that I deserve the utmost rigour of lecturing. No, you are not bad. You are a dear, but as slippery as an eel when I want to get a confession from you. Oh, yes, I am bad, and obstinate, and all sorts. It is no use your pretending I am not. People who are good don't want scolding as I do. But now that I have nobody but you and nobody to defend me, it is very hard that I mustn't have my own way in deciding how I'll live with you and whether I'll be married or no. Sue, my own comrade and sweetheart, I don't want to force you either to marry or to do the other thing. Of course I don't. It is too wicked of you to be so pettish. Now we won't say any more about it, and go on just the same as we have done. And during the rest of our walk, we'll talk of the meadows only, and the floods, and the prospect of the farmers this coming year. After this, the subject of marriage was not mentioned by them for several days, though living as they were with only a landing between them, it was constantly in their minds. Sue was assisting Jude very materially now. He had latterly occupied himself on his own account in working and lettering headstones, which he kept in a little yard at the back of his little house, where in the intervals of domestic duties she marked out the letters full size for him, and blacked them in after he had cut them. It was a lower class of handicraft than were his former performances as a cathedral mason, and his only patrons were the poor people who lived in his own neighbourhood and knew what a cheap man this Jude Fawley monumental mason, as he called himself on his front door, was to employ for the simple memorials they required for their dead. But he seemed more independent than before, and it was the only arrangement under which Sue, who particularly wished to be no burden on him, could render any assistance. End of chapter 1